Welcome to the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art, the Brooklyn Museum. My name is Rebecca Taffel, and I'm the Director of Programs for the Elizabeth A. Sackler Foundation. Um, I'm really happy to welcome you all here today for Close Rikers, Build Communities. Um, we have activists from two local New York organizations, Just Leadership USA and Vocal New York. Um, this is a discussion that I've wanted to have for years, so I'm really happy we have the right people to do it and lead the conversation and let us know how we can all get involved. Um, this program is the third of our series this fall, um, which is a series that the foundation produces called States of Denial, the Illegal Incarceration of Women, Children, and People of Color. We began the series back uh, in March of 2014, and all of our previous programs are online. You can go to the Sackler Center's website, which is at www.brooklynmuseum.org slash EASCFA slash video. Um, and it's an ongoing archive of programs, and this program will eventually be up there as well. Um, I hope you'll also come back to join us for the next program in the series, which is on November 19th. It's called Becoming Ms. Burton, Reentry, Healing, and a New Way of Life. And it's a discussion with, uh, with Susan Burton um, and her fellow advocates to personalize the impact of mass incarceration and point the way to structural and policy changes that offer formerly incarcerated people greater access to lives of meaning and dignity. Um, and that program will be presented with the New Press, uh, in partnership with the New Press and with Brooklyn Community Foundation. Finally, I want to thank Novo Foundation for their support, uh, their past support of this ongoing series, and um, we're really pleased to have their support for our 2017-2018 series. So thank you very much to them. And now I'd like to introduce Sarita Daftry Steele. Uh, an activist from Just Leadership USA who will take us into today's panel. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for making it here in the pouring rain to join us. We're really excited for this conversation. Um, so I'm just going to kick it off by actually introducing our moderator, uh, Darren Mack, who will introduce the rest of our panelists. Um, our organization and our campaign is one in which uh, we believe strongly that it needs to be led by our members, so it makes sense for this entire conversation to be led by our members. Um, so um, I'll just introduce Darren briefly. Uh, Darren's our moderator. He'll be leading us through the panel. Um, Darren is a social and criminal justice reform advocate in New York City, uh, born and raised in Brooklyn. At the age of 17, Darren was incarcerated and served 20 years in New York State prisons. During his incarceration, he was accepted into Bard College's prison, uh, prison initiative, or Bard Prison Initiative, sorry, where he received his bachelor's degree. Since his release in 2012, Darren has been an active member of the CUNY Black Male Initiative, the Education from the Outside, Inside Out Coalition, and Just Leadership USA. Darren has been one of the most active and most reliable members of our campaign from the start. So you will, you will learn a lot from uh, our conversation that he's leading. Um, and he is currently pursuing a master's degree um, at the Hunter College Silverman School of Social Work uh, with a concentration in community organizing. So I will turn it over to Darren for the rest of our conversation. Thank you, thank you. Welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the Brooklyn Museum. I'm glad to be here, I'm excited. As Sarita said, I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, New York and I'm excited to be here today. So I'm a member of Just Leadership USA, which is an organization that was founded in 2014. Just Leadership launched a bold mission, which is to cut the US correctional population in half by 2030. Through legislative reform and advocacy campaigns, led and driven by the voices of people directly impacted by mass incarceration. We advanced the message of half by 2030 by starting right here in our own backyard of New York City with Rikers Island. Now Rikers, we all know around the country, Rikers is known to be the most violent and notorious jail in existence. Last year, in April, 
the campaign on the steps of City Hall, the campaign was launched on the steps of City Hall. The mayor at that time, he said that closing records was unrealistic. Some people even said that it was a fantasy. So we responded. Several months later, nearly 1,000 New Yorkers marched in Queens to Rikers near the beginning of the Bridge of Pain, the bridge that takes people to Rikers Island. Now at that time, the Bridge of Pain that takes people to Rikers Island is, is known for people who've been going back and forth to Rikers Island. Thousands of people work there and thousands of men, women, and children live there. So at this time, we're gonna show a short video And when I came here to Rikers, even though it was for a short amount of time, I feel as though I lost something here that I was never able to get back. Blood has been shed at Rikers Island. Blood has been shed in this whole criminal justice system. The level of violence that takes place in this community across the way here is outrageous. This is like a cancer. When you come in here, you could be perfectly fine, innocent just waiting, awaiting trial, and let the corruption take hold of you. Let the discrimination, the injustices take hold of you. Yeah, so during this time when we marched, the city had basically a half a billion dollars set aside to construct a new jail on Rikers Island. And after this march, the, the former commissioner of Rikers was asked, you know, what about this new construction? What about building this new jail? And he expressed that because of the closed Rikers movement, that that was on pause. So this was a big victory for the campaign. This was a big victory. And we didn't stop there. We didn't stop there. In December, faith leaders across the city came together with New Yorkers and had a visual near Gracie Mansion. And we didn't stop there. We continued to organize and mobilize directly impacted people and New Yorkers from across the city until over 160 organizations endorsed the campaign. In less than one year, on the eve of the one year anniversary since we launched the campaign to close Rikers, the Blasio announced that it will be the city's official policy to close Rikers Island. So despite this great achievement in a short amount of time, we are not at the finish line yet. We still have a lot of work to do. So today I have the pleasure to introduce you to some of the most fearless, and remarkable leaders of this campaign. So first off, I want to introduce Marie Fuchs. She's a member of Just Leadership USA in the Close Rackets campaign. Marie is a millennial, born and raised in Astoria, Queens. She attended the California Institute of the Arts, earning a BFA in the spring of 2014 and a minor in creative writing. Marie is not a very patient person, 
believing strongly that a turn into jail can happen and will happen so long as we continue to educate and correct people when they're wrong, to hold hard conversations with people when they don't agree. So Marie, will you join us to the panel? <laughs> Next, I'm glad to introduce Herbert Murray. Herbert Murray, he is a member of the Close Rikers Campaign and Just Leadership USA. Herbert was arrested in 1979 at the age of 21 for a murder he did not commit. After two years and two trials, he was found guilty and sentenced to 15 years to life in prison and subsequently serving 29 years. Since returning home, Herbert has become an advocate to close Rikers Island because of the ongoing corruption and violence there. He works for the Times Square Alliance as a supervisor and wrote a book called Standing Tall in Times Square, which details his story during and after being incarcerated. Herbert has also a, a completed meditation training with the New York Peace Institute. Will we please give up a warm welcome to Herbert Murray. <laughs> Last but definitely not least, Marilyn Reyes Sc Sc Scalis. Scalis. Born and raised in the Bronx, Bronxdale Project, is a mother, a grandmother, an activist, a public health worker, and so much more. Fueled by her experiences and her desire to improve job prospects for people coming home from incarceration, Marilyn joined Vocal New York and became a core leader in Vocal New York's efforts to pass the Fair Chance Act in New York City. Marilyn has served as a peer educator with New York Harm Reduction Educators for the last four years. She is also co-chair for the Peer Educator, Peer Network of New York. Marilyn's advocacy uplifts her own experience, but also the experience of so many women who have had their lives upended by the failed drug war and mass incarceration. Recently, she became a member of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. Will you please welcome Marilyn? You're welcome. Man, it's amazing. It's amazing. So, we want to begin by the first, you know, the first question. Let people know a little about yourself. Um, so, could you please tell us, tell our audience, about your personal experience of the criminal justice system and and what you learned from that experience about like, how the system should be reformed. So, I guess anybody can tackle that. Well, I uh, begin. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming out today. And uh, I really appreciate you all because we are in a serious situation with Rackers Allen. Um, as he indicated, uh, in 1979, I was 21 years old and I was arrested for murder in the second degree, a murder I did not commit. I had a police officer who came forth and said that had I committed this crime, he had to be my co-defendant because he was with me that all day. Subsequently, as he indicated, I was convicted, sentenced to 15 years of life, and did 29 years. I became a adamant, I'm so strongly, my, my, just my advocacy of closing Rikers Island became a passion because of the ongoing corruption and violence that's going on in Rackets Island. There's no reforming in Rackets Island. Um, there's nowhere in the world that you have a ratio of correction officer and, and um, residents. You know, so the ongoing corruption 
just uh, continue to uh, have a part in those kids' life. I am not the target no more. They got 29 years out of me. These kids are the targets. So this is why we all became so adamant about getting Rackets Island's Island, Island closed. That's interesting because like your experience on Rackets Island decades ago is like still continuing to this day. Absolutely, definitely. And the condition of it. When I went in there in 1981, I was in a cell block that was approximately 120 residents, um, one TV, uh, two telephones, um, eight showers for 120 people. Just the condition of it, it just generated violence. And it just, and then on top of that, the criminal justice system, our broken down criminal justice system is just, just ongoing, not giving us the justice because we poor. So we go in this condition, be being denied, so we just automatically angry constantly because there's no justice in the conditions in Rackens Island. This is why we so strongly believe that Rackens Island should be closed. Wow, thank you for sharing that because I know it's hard to like share like an intimate personal experience, you know, especially something like that. So next, who want to... Um your personal experience, you know, with the criminal justice system and what you learned from that experience, you know, about, about how it should be reformed? My personal experience was I, I used to use drugs. In January, I made 22 years drug free. And I was a heroin user. So in due time, I started selling drugs to support my habit. It wasn't because I wanted to be a criminal. And in the process of me selling drugs, I started getting arrested. I would go in and out. And finally, I had a felony, which is uh, I had a drug sale. But at this time, I didn't do the drug sale. I was outside with a bunch of other people. Someone in that group made a drug sale, and there was three blondes. And the cops run up and say, How many, oh, which blonde are we going to take today? Fortunately, that was my time. So um, they took me in. I was in Rikers Island about a year and a half fighting my case. And during that time, I would go back and forth to court, still in, in, in Rikers. Um, they were trying to give me some big time. I, I didn't make the sale, so I was holding out to try to prove. But eventually, it became too much for me. And the separation from my children, my family, my community was very, um, it was taking a toll on me. So I made a choice. I said, well, they finally brought it down to two to four. Um, I accepted the time. But um, during the court process, I was like, I told the DA, what did I do? So, you know, he was telling me what I did. Right there shows how injustice system is. You know, I needed treatment. I asked for treatment. They would not give it to me. And that's, that's the sad part because at times, I don't like saying this, but if it was a white person, it would equal treatment. But since it's black and brown people, it equals jail. And that's a real reality. And it, and it saddens me that I have to say it, but it's the truth. So I finally went, did my two to four. Um, I did close to two years. I was released on work release. I did my work release. I never went back. I came home in January 21st, 1997. And through the process, I tried to get a job. I, I got my kids back. I finished parole. I mean, I, I did everything right, but I couldn't get on track. I mean, I couldn't even get a job. And I started, I decided to go to a harm reduction agency. Anyone, everyone knows what harm reduction is or you don't? All right, harm reduction is, is another form of drug treatment for people that are actively using or former users and they have a wide range of services. For me, I found holistic therapy there, meditation, acupuncture, and that kept me from ever using again. And I still use it today because it works for me. And that's the beauty about harm reduction. You have choices. 
if you need therapy. Um, and the reality is some people will never stop using. So, um, you know, there's also um, substance abuse reduction services, which is acupuncture service, and they also have syringe exchange, they have um, condoms, they, they educate, it's about education. And people, you know, they come in, they get the syringes, they leave, but at least they're not getting HIV, hep C, and it's a prevention from acquiring things that come with drug use. You know, so everybody, you know, there's different choices. And that's what harm reduction is about, meeting someone where they're at and assisting them in whatever they need. Because I, will, I am the expert. I am the expert of drug use. I am the expert on prison or jail. So um, I found my way there. I started doing the holistic. I did their peer program. My life changed. I started giving back to my community. I started giving back to my community. Then I got involved in advocacy. I was introduced to Vocal New York. And I just, I loved it because it was about really talking about the issue, telling the stories that people really don't talk about. I mean, putting it out there. I mean, I put my life out there. I was a little scared because I have six children and a lot of, and the last four really didn't know my story. But, you know, like the first two. So, but I was embraced by my family, my children, and it helped heal us because, you know, it, it still takes me, my oldest kids suffer the most through my using and is, I'm still working on building my relationship with them because they always have a little distrust. But anyway, I knew I couldn't find a job for years and that's why I became proactive in fighting for the Band the Box Fair Chance Act. And October 27, 2015, it became law. I was with the mayor, de Blasio, when he signed it into law. He gave me the pen he signed it with. So I look, then I got involved in Close Rikers and I'm passionate about that too. And I can't wait till they close it down. Yeah, it's amazing, like, like your experience when, you know, I remember when the war on drugs happened and it was our country's policy to, for the war on drugs, it was basically what led us into mass incarceration. And today, it's not opioid or heroin, the drug, the opioid crisis is not looked at the same way it was looked, at, looked at in the 80s. It's more looked at as a public health issue, it's an epidemic. So you definitely speak to you know, the difference of how policy you know, target people and how you know, it affects our community. So Marie, would you like to tell us you know, yes. your personal experience and what you learned from that experience and how you know, the system should be reformed? Um, well, my, uh, this is, uh, thank, I want to just thank everybody for being here for one. These conversations are very important. They need to happen. Um, in order to educate people, people need to be here. Um, and, I'm, and I'm very grateful to you know, see everybody on this panel, very brave and bold. And um, it's, you know, it's interesting because my story is actually a little different. Um, I never faced legal co consequences for my actions. So um, I, guess, I guess I kind of bordered the system without having um, faced any legal actions. So um, it's, in, you know, it started with uh, just like heavy, heavy drug use, um, alcohol, a lot of alcohol, um, just anything I can get my hand on. Um, when I was in California, I had just been admitted to school, you know, having those privileges of being educated and still taking advantage of them um, was something that I look at today and I'm so fortunate and so grateful that I didn't have to endure a story that I hear on this podium and on this panel today. You know, because I am fortunate because I had the money, I'm not even me, but my parents were able to provide me with, a, with an attorney, you know, for a statute of limitations to run on a felony case in grand theft. You know, like those were the things that, that essentially got me out of it, you know. Um, but even in, even in those circumstances, you know, I have been dealing, you know, extensively with some mental health issues, you know. Um, doesn't mean that 
uh, doesn't mean that it's jail, you know, doesn't mean that it has the, the power of prison and just that word alone is very loaded. And we need to pay attention to that too. Um, but I was hospitalized a few times, you know, a couple, a few times in California, um, out here at LIJ. And, um, you know, you, you, you meet people and, and it's just an interesting, um, I don't know, I don't know how to word the experience because it's such a personal experience for everybody there. Um, that, you know, it, it, in a way it, it parallels the environment, like those very muted colors, you know, just like, uh, you know, we'd have people who would trade, who would trade medication and stuff, like, oh, you know, I'm going to take this today, you know, you ha oh, you're getting that tonight, all right, you know, let's just trade over. It, it was just like, and it wasn't very regulated either, you know, but it doesn't, but it still means that it was a hospital. It doesn't mean it was a jail, it was a hospital. There was a place for treatment, whether people took it or not, or whether the staff, you know, whether they cared or not, it was still under the name of a hospital, which is a place where we hope to take care of people and treat them for, for these issues, you know? Because had I been put in a position where I, I was convicted or, I, or those statute of limitations had not run on my case, it could have been a very different future for me. Um, you know, then it doesn't mean that I, uh, you know, I just took advantage of it. I was like, all right, I'm just going to, you know, do whatever I want. And then next thing you know, I'm just being really, you know, violent and aggressive towards the people closest to me. And, um, you know, I guess, I guess that struggle was, was more of my story than, than actually facing those consequences legally. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, take courage to share that. Yeah, and you spoke to a lot of things, like for instance, of like having a means to buy, get an attorney to fight your case, and that reminds me of a statement that Brian Stevenson um, says. He said that we have a criminal justice system that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. And a lot of time, when you have the money. As you know, some of the like, most famous cases, you could get away with almost anything, and they treat you much better. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go to the next question, the elephant in the room, which, <laughs> which is, why should Rikers, specifically, why should Rikers be closed? And anyone could jump in. And well, I can go with that. As I said before, again, <laughs> it is because of the ongoing corruption and violence. Um, you know, um, Rackers Island became the breeding ground for mass incarceration. It's only there to break people's spirit. You know, and I mean, I mean, psychologically, they just break you down. And if you don't, if they can't do it physically, they'll start shooting you with medication. Now it become a mental issue. And then on top of that, you go to the court, and now the criminal justice system is failing us ongoing felonies. We are still in a, a 19th century laws where the crack academic was totally out of control, where these uh, president come out with the three strikes you out, all these laws and whatnot. And now today they're treating everybody like they drug addicts. You know what I mean? Because you know they figured out, corporate America figured out how to benefit off the crack academic. And that's exactly what they did. All right, let's stop everything. When I was up in Rackers, I mean, uh, upstate New York, I was working in a plate shop. I was making 13 cents an hour, and I made thousands and thousands of nice plates. And if I didn't do it, and I wanted to go to school to get my GED, GED and they told me no. Wait until later on you can get that. And I told them no, and they isolated me. They put me in a box and they made me do it. And I, because I did not want to be in that box for 23 hours a day until I can conform. So this is the, the, the mentality and the attitude what's going on with Rackers Island. It is three, four, five times it's worse in there. 
and just killing us continuously. Correction officers smuggling uh, our contraband to their friends because the correction officers and the uh, resident come from the same neighborhood. This is why they're so corrupt. You know what I mean? They underpaid. They underpaid so they feel they get an opportunity to take advantage of the residents. You know, the rape in the, the resident females. It just goes on and on and on, and it's just killing spirit. We have to close it. We have to close it, and we have to close it. Wow. So, so would you like to share your perspective why Rikers should be closed? What Herbert said, but um, from personal experience, I came home in 97, nothing's changed. Mm. That says a lot. If anything, it's just gotten worse. Um, one of the stories, Khalif Browder, that was one that really even made me more passionate because, you know, we're losing our youth. And it was such an unjust, he was innocent. I mean, and, and for me, like when I was there and I seen the sexual abuse from the officers to, on the adolescents, and then if an uh, inmate, as they call them, inmate was pregnant, they would call it community babies. Mm. And, you know, it just, there's nothing good. I, no one comes out better. I came out so traumatized from prison that it's taken me years to realize that, that it affected me. At first, I didn't realize it. But then, like two years ago, I realized that I have, I have anxiety a lot. But I didn't connect it to prison. But I didn't have it before. And now I understand why I have anxiety. So I'm able to deal with it without medication. You know, I, I do a lot of holistic and a lot of lavender. And it works for me. But I didn't realize that I was so traumatized until I started really going to therapy, deep therapy, and talking about what I went through and what I seen, and I, didn't, and I couldn't do nothing about it, so it made me feel even guilty of watching these young girls get m molested or raped, you know? I hate using that word, but it's the truth. They were raped and, and, and used. Wow. So. Yeah, the, that's interesting. That's interesting that you mentioned, like, your experience in the coming home in the 90s from Rikers Island, and then today, like the same violence, the same rape and corruption and violence that's happening there is still existing. And, and historically, Browder like spurred you to get involved with the Close Rikers campaign. You know, thank you for your, for your courage. If I just may add, in regarding Colleen Browder, you know, the, him killing himself, that's the exception. But the, the trauma, the trauma, you know, the ongoing trauma. This is the everyday basis, what's going on in Rackers Island. Right before I went upstate, you know, this guy got hit with a mop ringer, iron mop ringer. And because of the riot squad was so comprised from different individuals, it took them like between 15 and a half an hour to get there. You know what I mean? This gentleman, probably would have died. I don't know because they hurry up and rush them to the hospital and whatnot, but this is what's really going on, you know what I mean? It's no safety whatsoever from the correction officers to the, re the residents because the residents, they frustrated, they got razors, they have slicing people back and forth, giving people 150 stitches across their faces, you know what I mean? Because it's just, just too much. So yes, let's, let's close it. It needs to close now. You know, one more thing, even the officers are just as violent. Because I remember I had got, dyed my hair when I was in Rikers, and they said, oh, that's against the rules. You could get charged with another charge. So they put, made me stand right next to the garbage for like an hour. And they, I don't know, they, I don't know what they get out of it, but they get, it's like they have fun with the inmates. They, they enjoy putting us through stuff because, oh, because we use drugs or what, some people have 
mental health issues or whatever it is. You know, everybody has a story. Everybody's in, it comes in because of this drug war, you know? And it's just sad, it's just sad. It needs to close now. There's, there's not even no more time left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Marie, so yeah. you haven't been to Rikers Island, but what like, why you think Rikers specifically should be closed? Like you have a unique experience. You from Astoria, yeah. Queens, yeah. not far from Rikers Island. Not far at all. So why should Rikers specifically be closed? Well, I wasn't, I wasn't put in Rikers Island, but I did visit a friend there um, a while back, maybe like, yeah, like three, four years ago. And, um, and just going there, you know, I'm like, you know, taking the 100, you know, it runs from Queensboro Plaza down to Rikers. For one, it's the most inconvenient place to get to. For me, it's convenient, because I literally live right down the block from it. But, you know, look, thinking about living in another borough, you know, living in the Bronx, in Brooklyn, all the way in Staten Island, I don't know. It's just like, how, how do you expect your family to support you and be there for you just because of distance, you know? Just because you literally can't be present, you don't have, you know, it, it, it's just insane to me how, just how, how there are just all these detours and they're intentional, mm -hmm. you know? They're very, they're, they're very intentional and I think, that's, I think that's something to also pay attention to as well and something that's uh, very real. But I mean, we have 400 acres, right, of Rikers. All right, this is a jail, not a prison, okay? And at the end of the day, you gotta go through like three checkpoints. And you have family, you have family, you have, you have like a, you know, a mother with three of her kids. They're going through first metal detector, second one, you know, and then having to get scanned in another room, only to go upstairs and see somebody, to see, to see your loved one. You know, I'm sitting next to, you know, I'm, I'm across from my friend and I'm sitting right next to a mother with her kid and should, you know, saying hi to, you know, the, the person that was being housed there is, you know, saying hi to their kid. And it's like, it's like, is that how you, is that how we need to, like, you know, is, is that how we need to visit our family? You know, especially people of, people of color who are majority of who's housed there. You know, that's a reality. That's not, that's not uh, an imagined number. It's a, it's a, it's a very real number. And, um, and yeah, it, it, it's, it just makes no sense. It's so deteriorated. Like, what, what gain are we, what financial gains are we getting from it? To, to what, to maintain it? To keep housing, you know, detainees at 600, or was it $650, you know, for each individual? That's being housed there. We have 9,500 9, people fluctuating on a daily basis. I mean, that's crazy. We're so addicted to this punishment. It's like, we might, it, 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 I don't know. It's, it's just, it's really, it, it really blows my mind sometimes, even though it's, it's not surprising at all either, you know, that it still exists. It's, it, it, you kind of, that binary is just inseparable. It's, it's very real. Yeah, so. So, like, one of the things that, we, as you were speaking, and I thought about what you said and about how a progressive city like New York City could have a, a jail that exists like this. Because if you think about it, if we lived in a big city like Berlin in Germany, and there was a jail there that, that 70, 89 percent of the population were poor Jewish people it would be an outrage, knowing the history of Germany. Here in America, 89% of the people on Rikers Island are people of color. And there's, you know, people are speaking up now, but it, how long that's been going on? And thank you for the work that, that you've been doing. So the next question is, okay, so we close Rikers. How can we close Rikers? <laughs> I may. Uh, yes, again, you know, my thing is, first thing, we have to focus on the criminal justice system. It's a totally failure. Um, the bail, you know, this bail bond thing is just saying that you're guilty until proven innocent, you know, as opposed to a person who got money. You know what I mean? He don't never have to worry going to jail mm -hmm. because they saying that when you got money, you're not a criminal. You, you don't get convicted. So we have to eradicate the bail system, you know what I mean? Two, the speedy trial, you know what I mean? Now they got people that's on Rackers Island. When I was there, the speedy trial 
was like uh, between three months to 90, uh, three months to uh, six months. You know, you got people on Rackets Island right now sitting there for two, three, four, five, six years at a time. You know what I mean? Just all hopes are gone. You know what I mean? So we have to look, you know, really, really attack the criminal justice system. Because again, we're still under a 19th century laws that is not conducive for no one. All right? Third, all right, we have to um, build, uh, you know, we had a commission, and the commission went to five boroughs, and each borough had the opportunity to attend a commission to see how we can uh, lower the population and build smaller jails. You know, and I certainly agree it because when you have a lower jail, that means the population is not overcrowded. That means that the condition is not horrific. That means that when you have a smaller jail, you can invest yourself into the rehabilitation of the individual. We're going to make mistakes. Our kids is going to make mistakes, but do we lock them up and throw the key away and forget about them? And this is what's going on at Rackers Island. I work in time scale for the time for the last 10 years, and I've seen the growth on on growth in Times Square and how it became the biggest world tourist site in the world. And right next door, half an hour away, this is a cloud just hanging on Rockets Island. This monument, you know what I mean? That just totally destroying so many lives. You know what I mean? So so we have to attack the criminal justice. Don't attack people, poor people. Don't be courageous, de Blasio. Let's start conforming, I mean, reforming that criminal justice system so we don't have to be sitting there years at a time waiting for no justice because the justice system is failing us because it's not about right and wrong no more. It is about who tells the right story. And we all know that the district attorney have all corruption at his disposal. So yes, let's attack the criminal justice system. Yeah. So that's interesting you mentioned like bail reform, mm -hmm. um, speedy trial reform, because yes. the speedy trial law, I think it's actually named after Khalif Browder. It's called Khalif's Law. Yes. And the bail reform issue, that was an issue that he was impacted by because his family didn't have enough money to bail him out. And he stayed on Rikers for how long? Three years. Three for years. three years. Absolutely. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That's an injustice. So, so Marilyn, what, so how can we close Rikers Island? I agree with Herbert again. All them ways, but also, if someone has a drug use problem, should they be in Rikers Island? Mm. No, I think for me, treatment, whatever treatment they need, let's link them to it. If someone has a mental health issue, they shouldn't be in Rikers. That's been a revolving door for mental health issues for years. Mm -hmm. But people are not getting treated, so they keep coming back and forth, back and forth. So let's really treat mental health issues. If they, all that money they spend for one person for one year is 247000 mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. If they reinvest that money into the community and really provide real treatment for people, our community is going to get better. There's no reason to put people that have certain issues in prison. There's no need for that. Mm -hmm. Let's start dealing with the issues. Affordable housing, homelessness is not a crime, yet people are put in prison because they're homeless. Mm -hmm. They call it laundering. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's amazing because, like you said, over $200,000 each year to house a person on Rikers Island. Like with that money, a person could go to Yale, Harvard, <laughs> yeah. and get a PhD, <laughs> you know? And you're right, you know, that money should be invested in the community. I definitely, most people agree with you on, on that because it's definitely costing taxpayers a lot of money to basically just, you know, punish people. So. They put more money in prison than they do in education. That's a damn shame. Mm. Seriously. Yeah, and if we think about it, like, like you brought up education, like when it comes to like a failed school, we don't really have a discussion of whether it should be closed or not, we shut it down. Especially after reforms are happening, like reforms, after reform happened with school, and if it's still failing, we close it down. But what about a failed jail? 
You know, what about Rikers Island that's actually like taking people's lives? You know, and we, it should be no discussion about it. We need to, I agree, we should definitely close it. So the next question, how do you imagine your community after Rikers is closed? Anybody could answer that? Safe, <laughs> safer, um, more trusting. Um, I think it's just really important that that we, you know, we shift that philosophy of how of how we see people, you know, how people of color. It's it's very much a reality that needs to be accepted first, and that's that's something that you know is is obviously not accepted by certain people, um, including the color that I am right now, you know, and that I've always been. So it's about acknowledging your privileges first and accepting the fact that you can be a part of a conversation if you understand it and if you respect the experience and, you, and you're genuine. That's how, that's how change happens, is here first. It's all about it, it's, it's all about like why, it, you know, if it's not genuine, it's not there and it'll never happen, you know? It, having, you know, having nonprofits, having, um, you know, just being involved in your community uh, writing to your city council members, like, you know, um, pushing, like, pushing legislation and really, like, coming out to Albany and lobbying, whether it's with us or on your own time or whatever organization you're with or want to become a part of after, whether it's between two to four, then maybe you might want to take this somewhere with you. And, and I think, yeah, I just, I think that the, the mentality and the philosophy needs to shift in, in how we're, um, and how we're so addicted and rely, uh, and we rely so much on punishment that it, that it, it's, you know, it's just, yeah, in order for that, in order for us to really, like, move forward and just reduce the population significantly by um, taking juveniles out of a, out of a jail, mm. uh, particularly Rikers Island, obviously. Wow. Thank you. Herbert? Um, yes. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, with uh, Rackers Island and transporting the, the residents to the courts in the boroughs, that is millions of millions of dollars. You know what I mean? This is why I said that the smaller uh, communities, the smaller jail work, we can stop that. You know, all those millions and million dollars being invested to transport uh, the residents from the boroughs, you know what I mean? Let's use that money to invest for prevention. Mm. You know what I mean? We have to start investing in our schools. Our school is becoming the pipelines of prisons. Mm. You know what I mean? And it's just horrible. And again, we have to be mindful. We are, we not the targets, our kids are. You know what I mean? It, it is, they're gonna make some mistakes. You know, what are we gonna do with them? We have to educate them. We have to open those prison doors for us, for guys who are, uh, are closer to the problem, are closer to the solution. This is how we thrive. You know what I mean? We made a mistake. We know what is needed to help a person who's been in the same shoes that I've been into. You know what I mean? It's not because I was innocent. It's because what I went through. And this is why I am so adamant about getting records out and closed, because it's not working. So they're investing so much money in the maintaining records out. Let's close it and use that money to invest in education, education and education. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, thank you so much for yes. that. Uh, a billion dollars a year, you know, they say that it costs one billion dollars a year to operate Rikers Island. And Crazy. definitely money like that should definitely be um, pushed towards communities of education. Absolutely. So Maryland, so how do you imagine your community after Rikers is closed? When I first heard that question, I smiled. I see my community thriving again. I see mothers not have to go visit their children. I see my community in a healthier way. Real treatment, housing is a big issue. If they will invest that money also in housing, education, and really put that money in my community, I see my community thrive. I see them working, having jobs. I mean, I see so many good things for my community. And 
I can see it. We just need the rest of the world to see it. Yeah, thank you so much. The rest much. of the world with the resources and the money. Right. So, then so you know, keep it pushing. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, guys. Yeah, so like communities that you came from, like, you know, the Bronx and you, and I came from you know, like the old Bushwick. I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> and in, my, in the Bushwick today, I say the old Bushwick because the Bushwick today is much different from the Bushwick that I was raised and born and raised in. And, mm -hmm. and those communities have been historically under resourced. So mm -hmm. I definitely agree with what everyone says about reinvesting into money, the money into communities that's been mostly impacted by Rikers. So with that, if, if there's any questions from the audience, we would like to take the panel, we'll take some questions about the campaign. Yes. Hi, my name is Julie, thank you. Hello, um, Julie. Hi, hi everybody. I have a question, um, which is a little bit different, um, I think, from the usual question. I, I agree with all the reasons to close Rikers and a whole other list we could all make if we had more time. I have two concerns, which I think about a lot um, as we do this work and as I'm out in the world, which doesn't necessarily agree with us, trying to talk about these issues. So these are my concerns. Um, in, in terms of talking about how much maintaining Rikers costs, we have to remember that there are interests that are making a lot of money from that. Uh, the bail bond industry, um, and in the larger picture of private prison corporations, et cetera. They're not gonna give that up so easily. That's number one. So to you and me, it makes 100% sense to invest that money in communities because we're human, and that's what we wanna do. Number one, not everyone wants to do that. And number two, there are people who, if I told them everything that you just said, they th actually think that if you quote unquote committed a crime and you've been sent to a place like Rikers, kind of so sad, too bad. They actually don't care, which is sometimes hard for me to understand, but it's true. And so I think a lot more, having done this work for a long time, I think, how do we really change people's hearts and minds? And I don't have an answer, and I don't, I'm not expecting, like, you know, the formula for that, but what, I think what, since you know me, you understand my question. Yes. How do we really change what's in people's hearts? Well, I, I'm, I'm a storyteller. I love story. We buy movies after movies after movies, because we love stories. We have to tell our story. Our story has to be authentic. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't like to tell on themselves. You know what I mean? But they don't understand how society forces us into a lifestyle. You know, society beat us up constantly. You know, and specifically with it, these kids. You know, especially during Christmas time. They throw all this materialistic things at those kids to force the parents to, and if you can't, uh, if you can't afford these things, you know what I mean, that kid's going to feel very deprived. And that's a horrible feeling. So again, I can't emphasize more with education. You know what I mean? Get away from the fairy tales. Let's start telling stories. Let's start getting some really hard conversation, like she indicated, to, to, to discuss solution to this problem. We have to have talk, you know what I mean? Of course, we losing our humanity, unfortunately. I mean, again, I'm in Times Square, and the development of Times Square is so profound. And just right there, people don't even know about, you know, Rackers Island. And we just a half an hour away because, you know, we losing our humanity. You know, so we have to get our humanity so we can be more conducive and try to help with the solution of that we face on everyday problem. Marilyn, you had something to say about like how do you reach out to people who may be opposed to like closing, you know, Rikers Island? We gotta continue having these conversations and telling the stories. Bottom line, continue putting it out. I mean, sometimes I've been in places where, yeah, people are not gonna change their mind, but there's a few that do, and if we get a few at a time, so what? We're getting them, and 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 they'll continue to con continue talking about it. And we just got to keep putting it out there. We cannot just sit back and not stop because people don't want to do it. And yeah, it's about the money. It's always been about the money. That's why we have a 50-year-old drug war. And it's all black and brown people, low income. They are in jail, Rikers Island. 
And can I add something, right. if I may? You know, and you know, that's why I'm so dis very disappointed with de Blasio, you know what I mean? First, he said reform, you know? And I remember one of his early campaigns, we was there shouting, close Raggers Island. And I seen him come down here. He's a politician, he got to stop. He can't just walk past us. So he had to figure out who can he stop in front of. And he wanted to get the, the, the most ignorant person because he don't want no challenge. So he tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, how you doing? And I said, man, we have to close this Rackers Island down. He said, no, 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 we're going to reform it. I said, no, you cannot reform it because it got too much history of corruption and violence. We have to close. He said, no, 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 I'm going to reform it. We're going to fix it. And he became so indignant, you know what I mean? Because I had an opposition of what he was saying. He said, you have your opinion and I have mine. And he walked away. And then three months, four months after that, he comes with a saying that he want to close it. 10 years? 10 years suck. Now you're recognizing that you, it is corrupt. You, it is violent. It is destroying millions and millions of lives. And then you telling me 10 years in a transition? Absolutely not. You playing politics with us. Stop playing politics with people's lives. And that's what we need to do. We have to put pressure on de Blasio so he can change this right away. Uh, the governor, he said three years. Let's go with three years to close that place. Definitely, like, you know, Rikers Island have been around for about eight decades, and if New Yorks could come together, if the governor, the mayor, and elected officials in New Yorkers stand up and come together and close Rikers, it'll be history. Yes. It, we could make the governor, if the Blas re-elected, he could make history. And that's one of the things that the campaign is calling out for. Question? Yes. Um, oh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kevin Smith. I work for um, Shelton Arms Children and Family Services, the Archers program, which is a transformative mentoring program, and we service youth age 16 to 24 who are on probation. So, um, and you raised a great question, Mr. Herbert, and I would like to uh, just quickly, before I ask the question, and you mentioned about Khalid Browder, how, and your experience, how the experience kills the spirit of the youth still on Rock and Silent. So, for whatever happened to Khalid Browd, or whatever is alleged, his, his untimely demise was quick. What about those youth still on Rackers Island whose spirits are being crushed by that experience? And then one day, a lot of times longer than soon, they're released back in the community, and then we ask how could they commit this violence? We ask how can they be violent? And some of the things that they're alleged to have perpetuated, you know, how, what do we say to that? And then we see we go at risk youth. Um, the definition of at risk youth is an adolescent who is less likely to transition into adulthood successfully and achieve economic self sufficiency. Yes. So, what do we tell the youth who are asking, why am I less likely to transition successfully into adulthood? Why am I less likely to achieve economic self sufficiency? What do we tell them, the elders, the houses of worships? the um, political climate, what do we tell them? Well, the thing is that, you know, again, education is the key, you know what I mean? We, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of negative influences out there for these kids because of, again, broken homes or whatever the circumstances, you know? I was uh, one of the um, directors of a youth-assisted program inside. And uh, one of the things I used to ask these kids, you know, who can you talk to when you got a situation? And a lot of them says they're friends. You know, they would not say they're parents. You know what I mean? So I ask that, you know, can a kid at your age give you a meaningful solution to the problem that you may be facing? And then they thought about it, say, no, no, no. So we got to encourage these kids that you, you, you got to find an adult. You know what I mean? When you're going through these situations, so you can have this conversation. You know, um, you know, again, I had them write me back, you know what I mean? Because, again, I wanted to see how they're doing. And a lot of times, they don't have the resources out there. Mm -hmm. 
You know, we go through these situations, they don't have the resources. They're keeping them to themselves. So it's easy for them to attach themselves with this superficial love with these games. You know what I mean? You might, I love you, son. You, you, I, I'm always got your back. And that feel good to a person that's not feeling too well. You know what I mean? So we got to attack these things. We have to have these resources out there so it be available for these kids. Otherwise, then they're going to be misguided because society is out of control. They perpetuate prison, mass incarceration. And the only way they're going to do it is by psychologically getting these kids to do wrong. Absolutely, because the ACS system is also like prison. So it's a, they're preparing them at a young age. Um, we need to put the human touch back in community. The hell with these phones and all this, you know? They, kids are more attached to technology than a hug. That's a shame. Marie, so you're a millennial. What would you say to like at, at risk, you know, young people that's like what he mentioned? Oh, no, I was just going to say something. I, I mean, I'm one of the few millennials to actually not have any social media, thank God. Um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not too fond of the, uh, the internet or, or television. Um, but, uh, but no, I think, I think, again, just branching off of what you guys are saying, it's just very important to educate and to educate them on the realities of how this world works. And um, to also just, you know, just be, be there, be present, like, you know, um, whether it's family or any support system, you know, it, it really helps when you have someone else with you, you know? And there are a lot of people that don't have that same company that, you know, I have in the room. My father, my friend, you know, like, my other friend, <laughs> my best friend's back there somewhere. But you know what I mean? Like, and I'm not trying to, like, even make it, like, a sarcastic thing as much as in it, it literally... Like without support and without and without education, um, it, it's it's very difficult to achieve. You know, it's very difficult to to um, to yeah to. I, I think you know where I'm getting, where I'm yeah. going. I'm just a little. Yeah. So, so yeah. So like the, what the campaign is whole of all of what the campaign is about is two parts to it. You know, close Rikers build communities, and those communities that at risk people come from. That's the same communities that I live in. And I think if people who are, you know, concerned about their youth and, and, and the way that they're going, then they need to reach out into these communities of young people. You know, I work with high school students at the Brooklyn School for Social Justice, you know, three days out of the week. And sometimes I share my story. They look at me, I go there with my suit sometimes, and they look at me and I share my story. Like, yeah, I was 17 and I was in the streets and I was arrested and I did 20 years. And they had made, they can't believe it. And I, and I share my experience of like what led to me living that lifestyle, that subculture, that negative subculture, and what they could do to intervene so they don't go that route. So, and so thank you for the work that you're doing with At Risk You, and more people like you need to continue to do that and reach out. Uh, any more questions? Yes. They could Good burn question. It. <laughs> Good question. So, the, so the question is, once Rikers is closed, and I believe New Yorkers will close it down. Yes, what, we what will. What we do with that space? You know. Well, I make it a tourist site. <laughs> you know, do it like Governor's Island. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a tourist site. They can make money, or make it a part of the airport. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So it's very. You know, you, we got developers. That's saying we can do something with it. You know, let's close it. You know, we have a lot of support there. You know, but we trying to put pressure on de Blasio and stop playing politics and tell him to close it. You know, so this is where you and all coming from, you know. Yeah. Write these letters and make these phone calls and, you know, let's put that pressure on de Blasio. You know, because he recognized it, it, it needs to be closed. Was, it, was it, could, it more of a, I'm so sorry, was it more of a question about what are the future of jails going to look like? I, I, I didn't understand what you, oh, you're asking about the actual yeah. land use. Oh, okay, never mind. A resort for the rich. A resort for the rich. That's what I say. 
So we got a resort. We got uh, make it a historical site. We have um, um, make it an extension of LaGuardia. I, I like that idea because LaGuardia is off is crazy. But uh, there's there's actually some detailing in the in the final report of the Lipman Commission um, where uh, there there were very clear models um, that that were like what was one of them? I actually have it with me right now, but. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, just talking about like the, like I know there are some like zoning limitations, you know, so they will, you know, it was, it was a very um, thorough report and how to, and how to think about uh, that, uh, what to use with, uh, with those 400 acres, well, from extensions of the, the airport to housing to, um, to a museum, to, I mean, there, there is, there's a lot of material, like, being, like, you know, we're thinking a lot about that, and there, you know, the, that final report released by the Liberal Commission is super heavy, and I recommend that, that you guys read it, because, um, education, you know, at the end of the day, in order to know how to do it, you need to be educated in the ways that people are educating us in how to do it. You know, I don't know if that makes, you know, much sense, but. Yes, nice. Yeah, so one of the things that, um, like people said, okay, what happens after Rikers? Some people have different suggestions of what should happen to the space. And there was also like a, 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 shit, a suggestion out there about actually changing the name of Rikers. You know, some, it was a campaign some years, uh, not long ago, that actually wanted to change it to like, a matter of fact, I think it was Tish James, um, public advocate, said maybe we should change it to Khalif's Island, you know, or something like that. Name it after Khalif Brown. And we know, like some people might don't know, like the, the, the history of Rikers. You know, it was named after Richard Riker. He was a, a judge in New York City, and he was part, a member of this thing called the Kidnappers Club, where there were people from the South would come and kidnap free black men and women, take them to Rikers Court, and he would basically send them back and send them into slavery after they'd been free. So there's been a lot of controversy around the, the name Rikers itself because we have this national discussion about Confederate monuments across the country, and we have right here in our progressive city an uh, island named after a person who was sending free black men and women into slavery. So that's another discussion in the, uh, of itself. In, 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 in addition to that, you know, um, we uh, know that the 13th Amendment emancipated slavery. But is that clause in there? Only way they can enslave you if you commit a crime. Mm -hmm. That's the trick. Mm -hmm. That is the new form of slavery. This is yes. why we call it mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. Because the businesses do not have to take their business out in third world countries. They can do it right here in the United States and put it in the prison. And when you look at these private jails, they are the worst. The medical treatment is worse. The treatment of the, uh, the correction officers is worse. They just literally killing. And if you don't conform, they're going to do everything in their power to get you to work for their, for that cheap labor. Yeah, and what's sad, like, what you mentioned about private prisons since um, 45, AKA Tiny Hands was elected. Um, <laughs> you know, the private prisons, you know, the stocks went up. So we need to really like pay attention to what's happening around criminal justice form, reform and its policies. Um, is there any other questions from the audience? Yeah, in the back. Hi, um, I actually work for the Lipman Commission. Oh, wow. 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 method of changing hearts and minds because that's what the criminal justice system lacks is like context and individuality and kind of taking into account, you know, some sort. But I've been wondering why his story got picked up when there's obviously 9,700 people there every day who experience some of the trauma. And well, can I answer that if I may? I mean, in my opinion, the reason why he's highlighted is because, not because again, the, drama, the dramatization is an ongoing basis of what's Rackers out, you know? And what make him so profound and make him a hero, because he did try to transform. He did try to make a transition back in society. And, and because of society, failed us. You know, we failed him. 
You know what I mean? He went and tried to go to school. You know what I mean? He tried to get a job. He tried to get housing. He tried to do what he would do by his moms and everything. But the dramatization, what he experienced on Rockets Out was just too much. You know what I mean? So this is why it's so emphasis on a colleague Prada. Because when we come out in society, we do try to make that transition to do right. But society keep beating us down. They stigmatize us. You this, you an inmate. You know what I mean? You have you ever been uh, convicted if you try to get residence, try to get a job, they stim they're discriminating against you. It just beats you down. Because once again, we allow this to steal our humanity. We have to become educated in, about prison in the United States because the United States has the biggest prison system in the world. We can put four of the United States in Africa, but we have the biggest prison system in the world. Two million people? Come on, we're too industrialized to have too many, two million people incarcerated. So anyone want to? I wanted uh, to just say something real quick. Um, just because it's not a unique story doesn't mean it's not a very important story. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very tragic situation, and as much as it's a reality, Currently at Rikers and other jails and prisons, um, I, it's it's very important, um, and and to for it to get that much attention was even more, you know, it, it was it was something that that needed to to be told, like, it, and it was very, yeah. Do you yeah. want to add on to your question? No, I just what I meant was I completely agree with what you're saying. I just think that more stories should be told. Yeah. Um, so then I was just like. I'm just trying to think how can we get those stories out the way that his story has been told. Like what, you know, resources were put together to really make his story one that we all know who he is, even nationally and internationally, people know what happened. Like, for example, last week someone died while at Rikers of an overdose. He was set for $50,000 bail. He was just accused of going in to try and steal quarters from a phone vlogging machine. He didn't even take the quarters, but he was caught there trying to do that, and then he died on Rikers. So there's so many stories that I agree are so important, and I'm not trying to belittle his, I'm just wondering yeah. how we can kind of connect those avenues. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I know like, for the organization Just Leadership USA is an organization, like one of the components is advocacy and leadership. So it's leaders of formerly incarcerated people throughout the country who go to this one year leadership training program with Just Leadership USA, and basically, they utilize these stories to change our system. So by connecting, I think one good thing that you start is by connecting with Just Leadership USA because basically it's, it's, we just went national and the campaign is growing and more and more people are becoming involved. And if you, if you connect with Serena right here, probably you can connect with her. Um, we could probably get more stories out like this. One of the things, like Khalif, he was advocate when he came, when he got out after the three years. He was very he was on Rosie O'Donnell's show. He was on a show with uh, Mark Lamont Hill, and and then when he passed away during the his life, they was, Jay Z had was an executive producer of a documentary, a six series documentary called Time, the Khalif Browder story, and they was following him to, to to bring his story to the masses. And he passed when he took his life. Unfortunately, uh, after that is when the documentary was. Um, Viewed on, I think, it was Spike TV. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's many Cleef Browders, and if you collect with organizations like Just Leadership USA, you definitely have a connection with leaders who are doing amazing work, amazing work throughout the country. Whether it's better or worse, though, people do deal with things at, at you know, at other levels. You know, like it could be something worse off for somebody else, and they could take it much harshly. You know, there's always, you know, it, it, you can never measure the experience that somebody goes through until something like this, you know, is, is, um, gets national attention. Any question? Uh, we're gonna go back here and then up front. I'm also interested in the story of the people who are profiting from this. Uh, yeah. Marilyn, you mentioned this, you alluded to this earlier. Has there been some research about the, the companies, the private companies that are following the prison? If I may, if I can. All right, go ahead. Let me just say this. Yes, absolutely. You know, in mass incarceration, there's a big business. You know, Well Fargo, uh, McDonald's. And, you know what I mean? You do the research, and yes, there are big corporations that we don't even realize that we're supporting mass incarceration. 
yes, we should be mindful of who we associate ourselves and who we would get our money to. Because if we don't know that, they invest in, in prisons. You know what I mean? So it's a lot of organizations that's out there that are investing with the cheap labor. How do we find information? You can go on now. You look it up. Yeah, yeah. Nasty conservation, uh, Well Fargo, and then it go his associates. It just put Well Fargo on there, and all of them are top popping. Yeah, up. it all pops up, and even on the start market. And I think like the, the documentary by Ava, Ava DuVernay, 13, she basically like highlighted a lot of the companies that profit from, you know, the prison industrial complex. Like, yeah, some companies, banks, yeah. the World Fargo, um, Victoria's Secrets, and yeah. the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. Question? Yeah. And, and the 13th is on Netflix. What's that? The 13th, the number 13 with TA, the documentary is on Netflix. I just wanted to say two quick things. One of the biggest is Geo Corporation, and right after yeah. the election, the stock just stored, and yeah. that, uh, soared, excuse me, and a lot of the stocks that um, uh, have invested in private prisons have really um, gained tremendous um, amounts of money since the election, so that kind of shows you what that connection is about. Um, yeah. And I just wanted to go back to what um, what Jean said before about what can we do when we hear about more of these stories of individuals who go to Rikers and end up dying or coming out and committing suicide. And I think um, even if we definitely connect in with teams like just leadership, but even like on your own, if you hear a story like that or if you see it on social media, you can also begin your own process of amplifying it through social media. Because when I saw that one about the young man who died from the drug overdose, it was being replayed mm -hmm. on Twitter over and over and over again, yeah. and then on Facebook. And then you yourself can bring that to the attention of other organizations or your city council people or your state legislators and say, hey, did you know about this? I mean, I think as individuals, we can put a lot of pressure on our elected representatives, both um, locally and statewide, and even nationally to say, this just happened. What are you going to do about it? And try and hold them accountable. Yeah, and what's like what amazing to me is that, like every seem like every other week, we hear about some brutality or someone mm -hmm. dying on Rikers Island, and we and we have other jails in existence in the city. There's a jail in the Bronx and Manhattan in Brook, um, Brooklyn House of Detention, right across the street from Million Dollar Condos, and we don't hear these stories coming out. And that goes to, that's a testament to what happened on Rikers. There's a culture of violence there that can't be reformed, and I think, you know, everyone here for like speaking up and advocating for its closure, and definitely, definitely a lot of work to do. People could get connected with um, the Close Rikers campaign online or social media, and yeah, you're absolutely right. So um, tell the mayor to read the, the final reports right there. <laughs> so if there's any more questions, if there's no more questions, I want to thank the panelists. Let's thank the panelists. <laughs> thank, thank the audience for getting here. And uh, we want to bring up Sarita and for, the, for the final comments. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to pause everyone for two more seconds, just because um, I, I believe that um, you know, I, I'm imagining that you are all very moved um, by what you heard from our panelists. Um, so in the back, uh, we have some materials, some information to take with you um, about closing Rikers. We also have membership cards with Just Leadership USA. Um, you have the opportunity to join Just Leadership USA as a member. Um, only For only about a month, you can be part of, directly of helping to fight mass incarceration. Um, but that's not the only way. Certainly donating is important. But um, we have also at the back postcards that you can fill out right now, very quickly before you leave today. Um, and spread a message to Mayor Blasi about why we need to close Rikers now, why 10 years is too long, and leave them with us. We're gonna, we're gonna try to deliver them to him in a big mass so that it's, uh, you have a more powerful impact. So don't take them with you, but please do fill them out today um, and leave them with us. Um, and we are we're gonna have a lot of work ahead of us. We know that, um, that the forces that, as, you know, as, as folks talked about, the people who are fighting for all of the interests that keep our prisons and jails full, no. they're not going to go down easy. We know that. It's going to be a fight, and we're ready for it, but we're going to need help. Um, so whether it's uh, no 
November 7th, if you, if you go on our Facebook page, we are going to be showing up at the mayor's polling site and reminding him that 10 years is too long. So first thing he sees the day that he goes to vote for himself for his second term is a reminder that that second term needs to include closing records. Um, so we have actions in the city. We'll be going up to Albany uh, throughout the legislative term to, to, um, to lobby for passing speedy trial, bail reform, discovery law reform. Those are all things that you can join us in. Um, so we have we also have that mailing list in the back so that we can keep you updated on those. Um, so I just wanted to, to close with that and really um, really thank you for being here and and ask you to you know keep that that fight and that spirit as you leave the room um, and joining us in this campaign. Thank you.